I gotta tell you, uh, Trish, I always see her when I see her outside of the context of filming. I keep forgetting who she is. You know, it's weird. You see people in costume and character, right? And then I'd be at Whole Foods or some restaurant or some place, and this beautiful, gorgeous woman would be coming up, Richard, how are you? And I'd be sitting there going, who the frack are you? You know. <laughs> but I gotta tell you, the hardest thing I ever did on that show, she would come up and put her arm around you, right? <laughs> this gorgeous, delicious, beautiful, smart, I mean, amazing girl. And I would have to pretend she wasn't there. <laughs> And I remember one time, I'm turning this way, she comes up behind me like this, and uh, Baltar is over here. And I have to turn and go past her and talk to Baltar as if she wasn't there. And I swear to God, every time I did it, it was like this. She was right in front of my face. Every, I could not get past. She was, the, you know, it's, it's amazing, that girl, and I don't know if she's been here, but, uh, you know, she didn't really have, I don't think, much of a theatrical training, you know, acting training. Um, she was a model, but that woman has this fire, this energy. She's the sweetest, most loving, most beautiful human being inside and out. <clears throat> and yet, she's got this fire you know, of the gods inside of her, and she can explode. That, that lady is such a gifted lady, but the minute I start thinking about that, I gotta tell you, I, I've never worked with a cast that was this smart, this intelligent, and beyond maybe the, what's the word, the cliche that you think of actors kind of being a little egotistical, it's about the money, the fame, all that stuff. I gotta tell you, the actors I know, and the actors that were on Battlestar, both old and new, these are people who cared about the world. These are people who wanted to make a difference in the world. I mean, even talking about Edward Almos, Lauren Green, any of these people, they spent so much time and energy going out there, putting their energy, their money, everything they have in order to help this world move to where we know it can go, which is a more peaceful, more loving place for all of us where we can all aspire to greatness. Um, I was proud to be part of that show and be part of actors that honestly were some of the best actors, the best writers, the collaborative experience we had on the new Battlestar, um, the writer, director, producers, everybody worked together with five handheld cameras. Uh, we got to really explore the material. Um, it was just one of those acting experiences that you will never forget. I could have gone on in that show. I don't know about you. Uh, I don't know what it is. It always seems like the, you ever notice some of the great shows go off too soon? And some of the other shows just stay on forever? <laughs> have you ever noticed some of the movies that suck and you wonder how in the world did that script get past whoever makes those decisions, you know? Think of the worst movie. Name me one really bad movie. Twilight. What's what? <laughs> Right? I can hear it. Twilight? Twilight? <laughs> All right. Here comes Twilight. Oh, yes! Gotta get that one out there! And then imagine a really, really great movie like what? Galactica. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? You know, I mean, imagine the people that make the decisions on what gets done and what doesn't get done. And how rare it is that we get a great TV series or we get a really great movie, right? And the unfortunate part is Sometimes, and this is sad, some of the least talented people in the world, you ever notice, are the most motivated to get to the top? Why is that? And some of the most talented people seem to be the least motivated to get to the top. And I don't know about you, but so often, probably in your own life, in your own business, usually the person telling you what to do knows far less than you. You ever notice that? Yeah. Well, I really want to see a different change, because I don't know about you, uh, I happen to like these shows like Firefly, uh, like Babylon 5, Farscape, all these great shows, Star Trek, right? Where are they? Do you realize there's not one space show on the air at the moment? Does anybody notice that? You know why? Because the business model for the networks does not fit those shows that for them, I don't think it's just a cost value issue. I think it's because they don't get it. They don't really understand 
It's what science fiction is and can be. Especially in this new marketplace, and by the way, I always tell people, this is a changing landscape. We are in the most powerful time of change. It's the perfect storm of change in history, seriously. We're moving to globalization. Old business models are giving way to new business, new innovative ways to do business. We're in a digital world. Whether you're a writer, director, producer, whether you're somebody who wants to create a new company, solve a problem, go out and do something that's never been done before, this is one of the most powerful times in history for going out there and not only making a difference, but really making a pot of fortune. All I can tell you is in the film industry, what we're discovering is there's multiple ways now that you can take an idea. Instead of waiting, like most of us actors, we're always waiting for somebody to hire us, right? The phone to ring. And I can't tell you how old that gets very quickly. And you're auditioning with 5,000 other people. You wonder how anybody gets the job. Do you realize that an actor can be really amazing and comes in second out of 10,000 people and yet you don't get to be on the screen, you don't make any money, and you were forgotten. So for an actor, what I've learned is and what I teach, because I teach at universities, colleges all over the country, is that we have to step out of this place where we're waiting for life to happen. We're waiting for people to come to us, waiting for people to recognize us, to see us, to finally understand who we are and what we've got and why don't they appreciate us, right? We all have a little bit of that. What I've learned is, is that life demands us to step into that world, step into life and commit to what we really want to do. It's like you show up on the grid, you become visible and it takes balls. It takes courage and strength to step up and realize that you are worthwhile, that you are valuable, that you have something to say, and that you might have some amazing epiphany, creative imagining, an idea that could solve an amazing problem and go out and touch the world. I kept thinking something's wrong in this equation. Someone's not getting something. So what I want to do is I went to Universal, I, went up, I called, I talked to the legal department, and I was trying to figure out, you know, who do I talk to, where do I have a meeting? They didn't even know they owned Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> and I finally, I finally got a meeting. I remember I went up there and I found a, a kind of tracing, you know, step by step. I started uh, writing like Battlestar stories, and, and then I kind of went up to Universal and had a bunch of meetings in places where I, it's like the rabbit hole. One department doesn't know what the other department's doing, right? Just a bunch of, everybody makes people, their friends, vice presidents at Universal. So you got hundreds of vice presidents that never make any decisions. It's true. And I'm pitching to these guys, and they can't do anything for me. But ultimately, they connected me to all these licensees because of the Sci-Fi Channel playing Battlestar. And they put me to, with, with some of the writing places, I went to iBooks, wrote Battlestar books, uh, went to Rob Leefield. Uh, Extreme Press and wrote Battlestar Galactica comics, did all this stuff, and then ultimately I started going, why don't I go pitch, putting together, you know, a new Battlestar movie or a television series. Went upstairs and I pitched to this company, the guy that was in charge of making decisions, and he couldn't visualize or understand what a Battlestar Galactica series could look like for today. And I thought it was a no-brainer, and I went out and I put together a storyboard, that ultimately had voiceover and music, and then ultimately go, how am I doing a little cut scene, a little live action scene? And I found some friends that had a camera, you know, and somebody that had this, and somebody that had that, and I went and did a live action cut scene, and I go, this is so much fun! And so I did another one. And then ultimately, of course, I have no money. And of course, my little credit card just goes ka ching ka -ching. but when you start doing something that you're really excited about, you forget about the money, you forget about like all of you with your credit cards, I'm sure. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm having the time of my life and I remember, I get to a point where I'm sitting in this big, huge building structure where they used to house the Spruce Goose. And I've got a hundred man crew. I've got fans from all over the country driving in with their costumes, their hardware, because I have no budget for that stuff. And by the way, if you ever do a no budget anything, let me tell you, a no budget, Anything is going to cost you a lot of money. Why? Because if you do not feed all these people that are working for free, they will mutiny on you. And you better have their favorite junk food. I'm telling you. I spent a lot of money on this no budget thing. 
And step by step, this little animated storyboard grew into the Second Coming trailer. And then we started playing it. I remember playing it at Comic-Con in San Diego the first time. And everybody had heard about this mythological trailer that nobody knew if it really existed because nobody made a trailer unless you had a movie. And I played it, and I remember the room was packed, like a room like this, ten times back, multiple screens. I'm nervous as hell because if you like sci-fi, and somebody screws with your story, changes it even a little bit, you know what I'm saying? And I was terrified that they were gonna hate this thing. And I remember playing it, and at the end of it, there was the longest, most pregnant silence I've ever heard in my life. A little bit like what happened to Ron Moore when he pitched his new Battlestar series to all the Battlestar fans. You saw that little clip on the, uh, the thing there? Well, I swear, I was terrified, and all of a sudden, after this long silence, was this explosion of people clapping and cheering and all this stuff. I could not believe that we'd hit a home run, and we got carried around the world to multiple conventions playing it, and guess what? Harvey Weinstein of Miramax, the, one of the top distributors, calls me up thinking, he's got a trailer, we got all these reviews, you must have a movie. <laughs> And Universal doesn't even know I made this thing. And I'm like going, they're going to arrest me. I'm going to jail, you know. And I didn't make it to make money, but I made it to inspire a revival. Um, it was one of the most extraordinary things I ever did because what it taught me was, it taught me that anything is possible. I didn't have a clue about how to put anything together. All I knew was I had this feeling, I believed in it. I thought this needs to come back. This is a story, by the way. I'm, I love great sci-fi. Sci I'm visionary, intelligent sci-fi. I love it. And so, there just was not enough of those kinds of programming out there. And networks always are in a hurry to get rid of those kinds of shows, right? I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm just taking each step, figuring out what to do, asking questions, and finding out that people were willing to come help me. Because the minute you have the balls to stop talking about what you want to do, and trying to get people interested in what you want to do, that you actually have the balls to actually go do it with whatever resources you have. If you got five cents, you do whatever you can with five cents. You just start doing it, and all of a sudden, I got all these people that were excited. People who talked to other people and said, you know what Richard's doing? And then I got Dean Cundy, the DP for Jurassic Park, Apollo 13, brings his 35 millimeter camera with 2,000 feet of 35 millimeter film. I get Volker Engel, who won the Academy Award for ID4 Special Effects Supervisor, comes on board, looks at my epic film that I made over 18 months, and says, Richard, this is never gonna work. He goes, he goes, this is gonna take you millions of dollars to do the post to make it look good. So what you gotta do is cut it down to like two minutes. I go, two minutes? You know, I had all this footage. And so finally he took me over to Dreamscape and they helped me to write a trailer script, right? Which I'd never done before, which I wrote. And then they helped me to shape it down to this two minute thing. And then they also helped, and this is back when CGI was in its kind of infancy. And I began putting together, you know, the designs and the ships and do the compositing and all that stuff, which I know a lot about now. You know, we were doing a lot of green screen kind of early on when not too many people were doing it. And it was just an amazing experience of slowly putting this thing together and then finally playing it and having the kind of response which every filmmaker, everybody in their, their life should have one time experience when you feel like you hit a home run. I, I finally got this thing going and you know, the funny part was, I also produced the 25th Battlestar Anniversary Convention and I invited because at that time I'd heard Ron Moore was gonna do this thing. Um, Tom DeSanto and Brian Singer who did X-Men, the movies, basically they had really wanted to do a new Battlestar series, uh, Sci-Fi Channel, Universal just could not envision doing a Battlestar series and they got a deal over at Fox but Fox dropped the deal when Brian Singer had to jump onto X-Men 2 album with them, the movie and then they dropped the Battlestar deal which was going to actually include me and Dirk Benedict and some of the original actors and then they took it over to Sci-Fi Channel uh, and tried to do it there not interested and they were only open to maybe doing a reimagined version which Ron Moore brought in. And everybody was against that, thinking they're gonna screw it up like they do with every classic they bring back. You ever notice how they take a classic and they give you the trappings of it, but they take the heart and soul out of the show that you love so much? 
And that's what I thought they were going to do. And when I honestly saw Nevermore, Moore, and I think he looked at me as Darth Vader because I'd written a few scathing letters, you know, about networks and studios and how they don't get us or appreciate sci-fi, you know, and how they screw everything up. And I wasn't being specific about Battlestar, but I was kind of, you know, making a point. And so I invited him because I thought, I'm going to invite everybody. I'm going to invite Ron Moore, Glenn Larson, Tom DeSanto, Brian Singer. Let everybody come and pitch their idea of Battlestar and then let you make your decision, right? And so guess what? He came and he played his new trailer. And back at that time, nobody had ever seen um, action scenes with no music, no sound effects, just drums, right? And we're used to that now, but back when they played it, we all looked at it like this, and it was the coldest, freezing room I've ever felt in my whole life. I felt horrible for him, I really did. One of the things I noticed, because no matter how different it was, I said, somebody has a vision. Somebody is talented. Even though it's totally different than anything I... And I remember standing up, and he kind of tells this story sometimes, and then Moses stood up in the room and calmed the people down, because everybody was pissed. Everybody was really angry. And I really just wanted to say, you know, I said, no matter how different this piece is, I gotta tell you, take my hat off, because there's a vision, there's creativity, there's heart, there's soul behind this. It's a little bit of a joke. Um, you know, would you be interested? And I remember for the first time in my life, but I had said no so many times because things weren't exactly right. Because I'm a very idealistic person. I was looking for something with meaning, with heart, with soul. You know, something that I felt that I could do my best work in. And so I always said no. And I closed down my career because I told, told, turned down so many television series. And then everybody stops coming. And they don't look at you as, you know, you're doing it because of a deeper, emotional, caring, meaningful reason. They look at it as you have ego and think you're too good for our project. That's why you're turning it down. So they get pissed off at you. And I really kind of closed down my career. And for the first time, I finally said yes, even though I was really conflicted. And I remember going in and having a meeting. And the first thing I noticed is that the writers on the staff, I had gone to acting school with. In fact, one of them had really had a whole profound relationship with the mother of my child, you know. And I'm like, wow, this is a little strange. Uh, of course, I learned a whole bunch of stuff I didn't know before, but I also, I also had a chance to really connect and realize that I was really amongst people that was like family to me. Uh, we had gone to the Eric Morris Actors Workshop. One of the best experiences I ever had is part of what I do when I teach. Acting is a process for everybody, believe it or not, and it's taught the right way. Um, anyway, I got cast on the show. It was a one-shot deal, and the one-shot deal turned into five years on the show. It was one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. Mary McDonald, Edward Almos, you know, uh, Katie Sackhoff. I, I think Katie, you know, amongst probably all the rest of them, but I'm not going to be surprised if she wins an Academy Award, you know, in the next few years. I, I don't know if you saw the new Riddick movie. I love Riddick, but I really didn't like the new Riddick movie. Anybody like the new Riddick movie? Yeah, see one hand clapping. It looked like they just threw it away. You know what I mean? It was a stupid, cheesy story, and they were trying to save money. But the best thing in that story was Katie Sackhoff. I thought she did a terrific job. By the way, I'm really proud of you, just sitting there being quiet. Honestly, I just feel so close to you. Back here, so. By the way, this is my alter ego. You have no idea how fat I was. A couple years ago. You know, the hard thing about watching yourself on television, I swear I kept thinking, how in the world did I go from where I was to being that fat by the end of the show? You know, and I realized I was going through a lot of stuff, and I don't know about you, you know how we all have our favorite little self medicating thing? Anybody like what? Donuts? Some people like M&M's, right? You know, I love... Oh yes, me too. <laughs> but but I would, I would uh, self-medicate on with chai lattes. And, and unlike most people that might have a chai latte in the morning instead of a coffee, I would have them every two hours. Because, no seriously, chai, I felt so good for about an hour and a half, and then I started to come down and had left up another chai latte, and I gained my 25, 30 pounds. And believe it or not, everything magnifies on the screen.
praying, so I had to watch myself, you know, get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So anyway, I just want to say that I kind of look at you, and I'm very <laughs> compassionate and understanding. Um, your inspiration. And, and, no, your and your discipline to sit there and be quiet and not say anything. I was terrified of letting him walk out and introduce me. I thought, I'm never going to get out on that stage. I know it. <laughs> liking all the space kind of shows and stuff. Um, my question is, what did you find like the biggest difference between working with the original series and the newer series? Um, the, f the original series? First of all, back in that day, um, they, I mean, that was the biggest budget ever in television history, believe it or not. Uh, and they had never done a theatrical style series for television ever. So they didn't really know what they were doing. And it was supposed to be a seven-hour miniseries, not a TV series. And halfway through the first opening three-hour sequence that we did, they decided to pick it up as a series. And so we didn't have story arcs. We didn't have the scripts. So they were in a hurry trying to catch up. And we ended up filming. I mean, usually a series takes seven days to film. Ours was taking 10 to 12 days. And that was four or five extra days of what we call overtime, golden time, double golden time. People got rich on the Battlestar set with all that overtime it took to shoot the series, which is one of the main reasons why they took the show off. They couldn't put it together fast enough, and we couldn't even get the shows done on time. Uh, they were having so many challenging difficulties. We were ended up filming seven days a week, like 16 to 18 hours a day. We were living on the back lot of Universal. I had a lot of hot sake and air popcorn, getting through some very cold nights, looking at what remained of the shark from Jaws right outside my window. Um, you know, uh, it, was, it was really, just getting through it was an endurance thing. Uh, and you really didn't have a lot of time. Scripts would come in at the last second. It was always emergencies, trying to fix things, you know. It was one of those really kind of amazing experiences that you will never forget. We all bonded together because we spent so much time together. The new show, what was so great about it was, it was really one of the most extraordinarily, I don't think there's another show that was filmed like this one with five handheld cameras where you had so much time to play and dance and interact with the actors, you could never show up on the set with a really dedicated idea of how you want to play the scene. You had to really connect to where you were as the character, what had happened to you, where you came from, but you had to step into that scene and let it all go and be in the moment because you never knew what was going to come at you. And the writers and the directors all worked together in a very collaborative way, and we were always trying different things playing with the scenes. We had so much time to rehearse it, to play with it, to try different things with it. I think it's why some of the best work ever done, I think, on television. And you know, Time Magazine called Battlestar the number one best drama on TV, period. Not just sci-fi, but best drama on TV, period. Although I must say, I thought the final year, my disappointment was, Universal, I mean, Sci-Fi Channel, would not give Ron Moore a two-year pickup. In fact, they almost canceled it the year before. And the problem with Sci-Fi Channel, I don't know about you, but they bite you two ways. You know, they charge you an extra premium cost for Sci-Fi Channel, and then they would charge you, give you 20 minutes of commercials, right? So you but never wanted to watch it when it played. You would T-roll it, you would download it, you'd wait it till the season was over and buy the DVD, which meant that it wasn't registering on the Nielsen's. So for them, they were seeing less people watching it when it was playing, which is all they cared about. But the bottom line was, more people were actually watching it. They just weren't watching it the old way. So they were going to take it off the year before. Can you believe that? And, and this show that got them such acclaim, and because Ron Moore couldn't get a pickup, he decided he didn't want to get canceled the next year without being able to resolve the storylines, right? So he decided to take one year and finish it. And the sad part is, for me, there was so much story to tell that he had to squeeze it into one year, so things got hurried, you know what I mean, got forced. Plus, you had a lot of actors having to go on to new shows, so you would have actors flying in and out, and they would be filming three shows, three separate shows, at the same time. So it was a really chaotic last year. 
And I'm just sad because Battlestar's too good of a story and too, too wonderfully written. I think it really needed that two years in order to take those storylines and character threads and to revolve, I mean resolve all of them. But at least he got to finish it. And uh, again, like I said, I'm hoping, I think Battlestar still has so much story to tell. And I, I don't know about you, but I got to see Battlestar the movie. Um, the original movie, even though the matte paintings were a little jaggy, uh, but I saw it on the IMAX and it blew me away. And I thought Battlestar deserves to be on the IMAX in the movies. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> One of the reasons I'm going to do a web series uh, to launch this new Magellan, it's called Guam. I've worked on it for 10 years since I was pitching Battlestar and couldn't get it done. I wanted to create something that had deep meaning and explore the mysteries of the universe. And uh, Guam I've been developing for 10 years and I want to do a web series to launch the novel and the graphic novels that will be coming out. But you know what my thought was? I thought, you know, with Kickstarter campaigns and all the ways that they're now raising money to do things, you know, where fans can get involved with $5, $10, the thought was, look what Felicia Day did with the guild. She went out there and created something that had never been done before. And by the fourth year, she had two to four million people watching it. And my thought was, not even worrying about trying to pitch it to a network, why not create a series, be able to reach the audience, and then, I don't know about you, but wouldn't it be nice if you, the audience, decided what stays on and what goes off instead of some executive in the boardroom? Do you realize how often decisions are made by someone who does not have a clue? about what is good and what is not good. And that means that you guys, if you like it, you support it. If you don't like it, you don't, and it goes off. But you don't need the world. See, a network studio, they had five million dedicated fans watching Firefly on Fox. That wasn't enough for Fox to, re to actually deal with their bottom line. But five million fans who would more than be willing, and tell me if I'm out of the box here, would you not take $10 a month to watch Firefly episodes? Would you not? I mean, we dropped $10 in five seconds. When you come here, it's probably out of your pocket before you even open the door, right? But you know what $10 times 5 million fans is? That's $50 million a month. On that business model, they could make endless Firefly episodes. And you could do the same business model for Battlestar, for Babylon 5, Farscape, whatever show you love. That's a whole new business model that the networks don't want to know about. So my thought was, if you actually create something that the audience likes, you don't have to turn it over to the network or studio and sell it to them. Why? Because if you give it to them, they can cancel it. And they always end up canceling the best shows because they do not understand or get science fiction. So again, my thought is, you know, who knows if it'll work or not work, but I want to create something where the audience finds it, the audience determines the success of it, and I take it out of the hands of the networks and the studios. I got two questions. So the first one, uh, Apollo or Zarek, which one was her favorite character to play? Well, you know what I always tell people, they always say, Jesus, how did you go from Apollo to Tom Zarek? And I go, easy, 25 years of prison abuse. <laughs> I say, but what I actually mean is that, you know, when you realize, I have been through hell and back, and I, I don't mean that lightly, but I have been through hell and back in my life. And honestly, I was able to honestly relate to Tom Zarek in a really profound way, and I know everybody makes judgments, but I always tell people, I said, you know, in truth, Battlestar was mirroring the world in many, many different ways. And if you really watch it more than once, and really look at it in a deeper way, you start to realize that, you know, obviously all these characters, there's just so, such deep, profound, multi-layered characters. But for, you know, Tom Zarek, you rarely got to see his private thinking or his private motivations. So you assume, because of Edward Almost, Mary McDonald, you know, Adama, that he must be a bad guy and have bad reason, right? But the truth was, is that Zarek, for me, was the wounded idealist who went to prison for 25 years fighting for human rights. And then he gets on Battlestar, and guess what? What happens on Battlestar post 9-11, after apocalyptic circumstance? Government, again, thinks they know what's right for everybody. And they want to suspend democracy, because we know 
what you should be doing. So we're going to save you from yourselves by making decisions for you. And if you don't agree with us, we put you in jail. So guess what? The so-called good guys were doing a lot of bad things and accusing me of being the bad guy who's trying to make them accountable. And so I was always being aspected. My character is the bad guy. And yet, Ron Moore told all the writers, believe it or not, to always put the truth in Tom Zarek's mouth. Of course, people always assumed he must be manipulating, lying, you know, playing for self-serving reasons. Why? Because Adama and Rosalind had an agenda. And yet, I remember in the final scene when they're coming to pull me off the bridge, you know what Apollo said? He goes, you know something? If you get past the arrogance, Tom Zarek is right. And I remember that statement that he made. Actually, Apollo actually got who Tom Zarek was. My only sad thing was, at the end, Ada got his final little scene with Baltar. And I just would have loved to have had a final moment with Paul, where you could have gotten an insight into who Tom Zarek was and why he was doing what he did. But yes, he was angry, he was a wounded idealist, and he had every reason not to believe in government. Because he had seen so often how government, in a post-9-11 circumstance, can drift left or right and become more dictatorial. I would love nothing more. How sorry than, are you? You know, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we have to wrap it up, folks. I'm terribly sorry. But before, my one indulgence of this panel, you have to wear the cape. <laughs> years to have this man wear this cape. I cannot tell you, but seriously folks, was I lying when I said what an amazing speaker this man is? I said, I met him in St. John's, and by the end of the weekend that I spent with him, platonically, at the end of that weekend, I was totally, I will move to Los Angeles with you, Richard, whatever you want me to do, but Halifax, put your hands together for one of the greatest men I know.